to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 the word of god says our god is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. What an amazing God the Christian serves. And in this series of lessons, we're going to be thinking about our God is an awesome God. We're going to highlight some of His amazing qualities and characteristics, as well as think about His awesome nature. And hopefully that will motivate every one of us to want to serve Him more faithfully. We're so glad that you've joined us for our program today. Today's lesson is being brought to you by members and congregations of the Church of Christ in your area. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about the Lord's Church or the plan of salvation, friend, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you and you will always be a welcome guest at their assembly. We're also concerned about your soul here at the Gospel of Christ, your soul's salvation, and we want to help you in any way we can in your spiritual journey as well. Please visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, we have a wide variety of good Bible study materials. Also, we have transcripts and video and audio lessons that are available. We've got just a good host of Bible study material that we'd love for you to access. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of this lesson, today's lesson, or any of our past lessons, we make those available to you free of charge. Just go to our website, fill out a free media request form, or you can call us and write to us at the information given during this program. And in the age in which we're living, don't forget to download our Gospel of Christ app, both for Android and iPhone. It's a great way to study the Word of God in such a fast-paced world today. A question is asked in Exodus chapter 5, verse 2. Who is the Lord that I should obey His voice? Pharaoh is told by Moses, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, let your people go. Why do I need to let your people go? Who is this God that you're speaking of that's telling me to do this? And friend, when we think about this question, who is the Lord? There's so many answers that we could give that would uh, magnify our God and glorify His name, but we want to highlight some of the qualities of God today. In this lesson specifically, our awesome God, we want to highlight some of the amazing qualities of God that, that motivate and encourage the Christian each and every day. And so, who is the Lord? Friend, our Almighty God, our awesome God, is holy. The word holiness carries the idea of without blemish, without spot, spot uh, no defect or nothing wrong with it. Pure and whole is the idea. And friend, that surely is the very nature of our God. Isaiah 57 verse 15, the Bible says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. God's name, He is uh, synonymous with the idea of holiness. And so when we think about God, we can't help but think about pure and whole and upright in every way. Let me give you another Bible passage that illustrates this marvelous quality of our God. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 3. We have this grand throne room scene where Isaiah is at. And as you're going to recall, Isaiah doesn't feel worthy to be there. And listen to what one of them around this throne cries out. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. That threefold epithet, 
Holiness is the very quality and nature of who God is. God is not one who can be stained with sin. God is perfect. In every way. He cannot lie. Titus 1 verse 2. He cannot commit sin. 1 Peter 2 verse 22. He does not change. Malachi 3 verse 6. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so as we think about God, how wonderful it is to know God is the absence of everything that is wrong and bad and ugly that we think about today. I want you to think of another Bible passage with me. It's found in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse number 2. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Friend, as we think about this, nobody even compares. There may, I know good people in this life. You know good people in this life. There are a host of good people who are trying to live right and do right, and we respect them for that. But no one even begins to compare. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says this, There's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin, except our God is the unique, uh, he's the one who never has to face any of that. And so God is the epitome of holiness. Now, you say, okay, that's all good and well, but how does that affect the Christian? How does that affect someone who believes in God? Well, here's the natural application from Scripture. Two passages, Leviticus 11, verse 44, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves and listen now, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Peter, the Holy Spirit must have had this in mind. When Peter penned these words in 1 Peter 1 verse 15, when he says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And so the natural application is, I want to be like God. I want to imitate Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. I want to have the mind of Christ, Philippians 2, verse 5. I want, to, I want to be that example to the world that I can be. And part of that is, I want to try my best to live a holy life. Now, friend, please don't misunderstand me. Am I saying today that we're perfect, we're like God? We're, no, that's not the idea at all. Do we sin and make mistakes? Sure we do. All of us sin. There's none righteous. Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23. But friend, I want to do my best to walk in the light. 1 John 1 verse 7. I want to do my best to, be, to live a life free from sin and try my best to live in holiness each and every day. And someone says, okay, that's all good and well, but it's hard. You know, it is a challenge. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, there is indeed a passing pleasure to sin. What is it then that when God is pulling, when, we're, when we want to live holy lives and the world is pulling us to get involved in sin and unrighteousness, what is it that, that, that motivates and encourages us to live a holy life? Let me give you just a couple of motivations to holiness. First one is found in this beautiful passage in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which, listen now, holiness without which no one will see the Lord. What is a motivating factor to holiness? A friend, simply put, bluntly put, I can't see God without it, and I want to see God. I one day want to live with God. I want to be with God forever, and I've got to do my best to live a holy life, if that's the case. Second passage is 2 Peter 3, verse number 11. Peter says this, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, since the earth and all that's in it is going to be burned up, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Friend, when I think about the idea of holiness, and when I think about how Christians need to live that in view of the second coming of Christ, I want to live a holy life. Wouldn't it be sad? Just think about this with me. We'll look at both sides of the coin. Wouldn't it be sad if I had been a Christian? If I'd obeyed the gospel, I'd been a Christian, I devoted 20, 30 more years to serving the Lord, and I fell into sin, and the Lord came back then? 
Ah, that motivates me to want to live a holy life and not let that happen. But won't it be wonderful if I've lived my life in faithfulness to the Lord, I've tried to live holy, and the Lord comes? That'll be a great thing. And so not only to see God, does that motivate me? But friend, I'm also motivated by the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, let's think then about another awesome quality of our awesome God. God is not only holy, God is merciful. And how thankful we ought to be for the mercy of God. Someone wants to find mercy this way. It always stuck with me. Uh, grace is when God allows us to receive what we don't deserve. Mercy is when He allows us to escape what we do deserve. Isn't that a beautiful picture? What do I deserve? Psalm 103, verse 10, the Bible says, The Lord's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul, here's what we deserve. The soul who sins will surely die. And yet it is the mercy of God that intercedes. I've had a top 10 list of my favorite verses. This will be real close to the top. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23 says this so beautifully about the mercy of God. The Bible says, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And so when we think about God, it, God's mercy, what's it like? It's like the sun coming up. Every, what's going to If tomorrow exists and it happens, what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, the sun's going to come up, right? What's God's mercy like? They're new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. And so every day presents challenges. Every day presents difficulties. But you know what? Every day is an opportunity for the mercy of God to prevail as well. Another beautiful passage that I think of about the mercy of God is found in Psalm 86, verse number 15. The psalmist says, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, listen to this now, and abundant in mercy and truth. What do we know about God and His mercy? It isn't as though God has a, a little bit in a cup or God has a little bit in a bowl. God is abounding. He's overflowing with mercy. And so, yes, God's to be feared. Yes, God is a God who doesn't want anybody to be lost. 1 Timothy 2, 4 but is going to punish those who don't obey His will. But friend, for His child who's trying to walk in the light and live right, how thankful we ought to be for the mercy of God. Now, just like with holiness, let's then make some application to the mercy of God in our lives. What does it mean when I think about the mercy of God and how do I apply that to my Christian life? Titus 3 verse 5, the Word of God records this application for us. The Bible says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Friend, when I think about the mercy of God, and, and my life especially, and the application, friend, it's because of God's mercy that I'm saved. It is the mercy of God that made that salvation a possibility and a reality. And friend, isn't there a little bit of reciprocity that we ought to put in here as well? If God has been merciful to me when I didn't need it or when I didn't deserve it and had not earned it, shouldn't I be merciful to other people? Shouldn't I be merciful to those who also may be living lives that are not the way they ought to be? And ultimately, if we're saved by the mercy of God, shouldn't we want that mercy? to be extended to others as well. And then there's the beautiful words of Hebrews 8 verse 12 that help us to make application to the mercy of God. God said this, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Friend, when I think about God's mercy, it's because of that mercy that I have forgiveness. It's that God said, I'll be merciful. God didn't have to be. God could have punished man according to his sins. But God said, I'll be merciful to their sins. Listen to this. And their lawless deeds I'll remember no more. How wonderful it is. This is what we're trying to really illustrate and, and show today. Our God 
is so good. He is an awesome God, and His mercy so beautifully illustrates that. All right, then, let's, let's think about what it is that motivates us with the mercy of God. What, what do I do then with? What motivates me to be a, a merciful person as well? There's a passage in the Bible that I think of in Mark 5, verse 19. This is such a beautiful picture. Uh, the context is you've got this demoniac. And that's a man who's possessed by a lot of demons. He is, his life is in shambles. He cuts himself. People try to chain him. He breaks the chains. He lives in the graveyard. He cries out. Nobody wants to be around him. Everybody thinks he's just a lunatic, as it were. And yet Jesus comes and casts all these demons out, heals this man. And listen to Mark chapter 5, verse 19. The man asked to go with Jesus, and here's what Jesus said. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion or mercy on you. Here's a man who's so grateful for what the Lord did, and, and you can understand that. We'd all be grateful if we had that problem and the Lord healed it as he's helped us with so many problems in our lives. And this man says, you've done so much for me. Let me go around and help you. And Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go home, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell people who know you what the Lord's done for you. Show them, show them yourself. Show them who you are now. Let them see your changed life and how God's had mercy and compassion on you. Friend, hasn't God? Maybe you've not been in the same exact situation as the demoniac, but at one time or another, haven't all of our lives been in shambles? Haven't all of us been lost because of sin? Haven't all of us been missing real purpose and meaning and hope in life? If that's the case, then friend, we ought to be motivated by the mercy and compassion of our God to go and tell other people about the Lord Jesus Christ and what He's done for them and how much He loves and cares for each and every one of us in this life. All right, as we think then about the mercy of God, let, let's move to another quality of God that, that is really so wonderful. Uh, our awesome God is also a just and fair God. Do you ever hear of any people in the world who've got double standards? Maybe for one person, the rules are this way. But if it's somebody they like, the rules are this way. Or we find out that one person may have tried to hold up something as a standard and then didn't even live by it himself. Well, friend, that's not God. Our God is just and fair. All men are going to be judged by the same guidelines, same rules, going to have the same reward or punishment, and God is going to be just and fair. I want you to listen to the beautiful words of Isaiah chapter 45, verse number 21. The Bible says, Tell and bring forth your case, yet let them take counsel together. Who has declared from ancient times? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me. Listen now, a just God and Savior, there is none besides me. And so God says, I want you to tell. I want you to check it. I want you to see. And what we find out is that our God is indeed a just and fair God. God says, check me out and see. And friend, you can be sure. One thing is you'll look through Bible history. God has always dealt with all men equally. God is not prejudiced. God's not racist. God wants all men everywhere to serve Him and obey Him. And if they're willing to do that, our God indeed is a just and fair God. Think about Genesis 18, verse 25. God said, or the Bible says, Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. And then this question is asked by Abraham. Shall not the judge of all the earth do rightly? And of course, the implication is we know God is going to do rightly. God is going to do what's fair and right with His people. And so we say, okay, that's good and well. I understand God's just and fair, but what's that really mean? What's the application of that? Friend, what I want us to realize is 
there aren't going to be any special favors called in. There, there isn't going to be somebody who gets something more than I did because they were like for some other reason that had no, that's not the way it's going to be. The prejudice, the, the bias, the, the racism, that's not there. God is just and God is fair. And the application is we're all going to be judged by the same thing. Listen to the words of Romans 3.26. The Bible says uh, our God's a righteous God is what he's talking about. And concerning his righteousness, it is to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Well, what's that passage talking about? Well, friend, the idea is very simple. It's this. If God is both just and the justifier, that is, he is a just God, it makes him able to justify as well. And so when we think about qualities that really stand out about God, I want to serve a just God. A God, listen, this is what this means. This is how wonderful, this is how awesome our God is. Regardless of where you live, regardless of what your economic status is, regardless of what the color of your skin is, regardless of any other factors that men often put so much emphasis on, I can guarantee you today, if you'll live by the Bible, if you'll love God, and if you will serve Him with all your heart, your God is a just God and all men everywhere will be rewarded equally. Another beautiful quality of our awesome God is that God is the epitome of love. You know, when you think about love, love is one of those things that moves each of us in so many unique ways. We do so many things because of love, and yet God is love. Listen to Zephaniah. This is a Probably not a well-known passage, but it is such a beautiful passage. The minor prophet Zephaniah said in Zephaniah 3.17, The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet or calm you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. You know, when I think about the love of God, I can't help but think about how that brings a sense of peace and calm to each one of our lives, knowing that, that here, God does not want anybody to be lost, okay? 2 Peter 3, 9, 1 Timothy 2, 4, that's the last thing God wants. God has done everything possible to save us, and it's His love that made that possible that ought to bring a sense of calm and respite to each one of our souls. Another beautiful verse about the love of God is found in Psalm 86, 15. The psalmist said, But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. When I think about God's love, there's no doubt He's abounding. He's overflowing with that love. But someone says, Okay, that's all good and well. You could say God's abounding, but show it. All right, let's do just that. Friend, our God, our awesome God, is full of love, is the epitome of love, and that is so clearly seen in His great expression of love, the sacrifice of His Son. Listen to these words. Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You talk about love, there it is. Uh, when we were sinners, when we were, had stabbed God in the back, when we were living a life for sin and Satan, God's love conquered and made the sacrifice of Jesus available. And then there's this beautiful passage that you probably know so well. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Listen now, in this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Friend, when I think about the love of God and how much that means and how much that ought to move and motivate each one of us, 
You've got to think about what God did. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. John 3, 16, you say, okay, that's good and well. What do you mean? Gave Him to come to this earth. He left heaven, the very place I'm trying to go. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. He came to this earth, didn't even have a place to call His own or lay His head. He lived a perfect life, went about doing good. They said of Jesus, He's done all things well, Mark 7, verse 37. And yet they would spit in His face. They slapped him. They mocked him. They eventually put him on a, a cruel cross and he struggled for every breath until he died. He died in agony and his words, it is finished. Friend, that's the final exclamation point on the love of God. God's love through Jesus Christ made salvation possible. Now friend, we wouldn't do justice to the idea of the love of God if we didn't encourage each one of us to respond properly to that love. What does it mean when a person says, I see people that say, have buttons or shirts or bumper stickers that say, I love God. Okay, what's that mean? John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 15, verse 14, you're my friends if you do whatever I ask. Friend, we hope today that we have illustrated so beautifully our awesome God. But more than anything, if you're not a child of God, we hope that you'll be motivated by the love of God to become a Christian. Let me ask you today, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world? John 8 verse 24. Do you believe that so much so that you would turn from a life of sin in repentance? Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Would you acknowledge with your mouth Him as Lord and Savior? Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And to contact the blood of Christ, to be saved and to become a child of God, would you be immersed in water? Jesus said this, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. You say, I love God. Well, friend, let's prove it by obeying Him and living a life in such a way that brings honor to Him. Again, we're glad you joined us today and we hope you'll stay tuned next time as we explore more about the idea of our God is an awesome God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go.